Hi. Well, I'm back. Let's resume our walk along the Via Della Rosa, which, as you recall, traces the very path that Jesus took 2,000 years ago as he made his way to Golgotha. As before, I'm not going to read the scripture verses, but I encourage you to hit the pause button and read and reflect on them as we continue our journey. Also, if anyone wants a copy of my written notes, just contact me or the church office and we'll be happy to send them to you. So let's begin. Station eight, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. In Luke 23, we find Jesus stopping to talk to the weeping women who were following him. Even in all of his anguish, Jesus is not too preoccupied to speak to the women around him. What can we learn from this? Jesus is still approachable to call upon when we need comforting. By the same token, when we have difficulties of our own, that should not excuse us from continuing to reach out to minister to others. It is very easy to become so absorbed with our own problems that we forget about the needs of others. The wor words he spoke here are a little confusing. Go ahead, hit the pause button and read the words. They seem a little harsh, but they are a warning to the women about the future destruction of Jerusalem and the misery that will come to them and their families. Another way of looking at the remarks, however, is to ask ourselves exactly why Jesus would tell them to weep for themselves and not for him. Sometimes we truly lament at the suffering of others, but in the comfort of our own fortunate situations at a safe distance. We ought to realize that we are sinners and that in some ways those who suffer are actually better off. Maybe Jesus is actually saying to these women what he has been saying all along. He is asking for their repentance and for a change of heart. Station 9. Jesus falls a third time. This is a traditional um, station. There is no scriptural basis for this. Jesus' strength is now completely exhausted. He is only a few yards from his destination. Not only does he bear the weight of the cross, he bears the total weight of all of our sins. Isaiah 53 says, We had all gone astray like sheep each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of all of us. In all of this, he still gets up and continues. It would have been much easier for him to simply give up right then and there, but he didn't. Sometimes in our lives, if we have been weakened and fallen before, it is more likely that we will fall again. That's the time we should become tempted to wallow that we could become tempted to wallow in our self-pity and just call it quits. Jesus didn't, and we shouldn't either. And now, as we proceed, a word of interest and background regarding the last five stations of our journey. The last five stations are located at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which exists today. The church is located among the buildings of old Jerusalem, sitting among markets and souvenir shops. The location has been a place of reverence for Christians since the first century, for obvious reasons. After the Jewish revolt in 135, the Roman Emperor Hadrian expelled the Jews from Jerusalem and leveled the city and built a new city there. In addition, he attempted to destroy the Christian sites to blot out their memory. The ground of the sites of the crucifixion and resurrection was leveled and a temple to Venus, the goddess of love, was erected in their place. Now, in 312, the Roman Emperor Constantine was getting ready to go into battle when he looked into the sky and he saw a cross along with the words, under this sign you will conquer. He instructed that a cross should be emblazoned 
on his men's shields, and he was victorious. He converted to Christianity and re-legalized the Christian faith in the Roman Empire. In 326, Helena, who was Constantine's mother, visited the Holy Land and learned that the sites of Jesus' death and resurrection were underneath Hadrian's Temple of Venus. She asked her son to fix the problem. At Constantine's demand, remember, always listen to your mother, the temple, the temple was pulled down and the basilica was built above the holy sites. The first one was destroyed by the Persians in 614. It was rebuilt, destroyed again by the Muslims in 1009, and then it was rebuilt by the Crusaders in 1149. And it still stands. The rock of Golgotha and the tomb are located within the church. So again, the last few stations are located within this structure. Station 10. Jesus is stripped of his garments. To be completely stripped naked in front of a crowd was even more humiliating in Jesus' time than it is in ours. And you can forget about the loincloth depicted in artistic images of Christ on the cross. In addition to that, remember that he had been severely beaten and whipped. His flesh has been likened to ribbon candy. This wounded flesh more than likely came off with his clothing, much like ripping a band-aid off a fresh wound. What does this image of the loss of all human dignity say to us today? What about the countless millions of poor people suffering every day from hunger, lack of shelter, and a total lack of dignity? Christ lost all of his dignity for our sake. Shouldn't we remember this as we try to restore the lost dignity of others? Station 11. Jesus is nailed to the cross. The time for Jesus' worst suffering had come. But it was also the pivotal moment in history when salvation came to humanity. Our assurance of salvation came at precisely this moment. It's sort of strange if you think about it, Jesus is nailed to a cross, unable to move, and yet he is the process of saving the world. During Jesus' time, the Roman government would execute certain criminals by nailing them to poles, trees, or specially made crosses. This excruciatingly painful and shameful death was reserved for the worst criminals. Why do you suppose that God ordained that the righteous Messiah should die such a painful and shameful death? Is it because that sin is such a horrible crime? Sin is the problem of the world. If God is going to forgive our sins without compromising his righteousness, then he must judge us completely, and the penalty for our sins must be paid. This is precisely what Christ accomplished for us with his unbelievably horrible death. How should this affect how we live our lives? When we think about what Christ actually went through for us, we realize how much it must grieve him when he sees us acting in ways contrary to God's wishes. The human response would be to say, I do all this for you and this is the thanks I get? And when we hurt and mistreat others, whether physically or emotional, isn't that the same as mistreating Christ himself? This is according to his own words. Whatever you do to these, you do to me. Station 12. Jesus dies. As in the case many times in scripture, there is a paradox, a contrast here. Today, when important events occur, there is usually much fanfare before and after it. Think of the important sports events, weddings, famous people, impeachment trials, etc. But usually, after the event is over, our lives go back to the way they were, and we were really not changed very much. But here, the most important event in human history took place, and there was very little publicity. Yet because of the death of this seemingly unremarkable criminal, millions of lives would be changed forever. Death is hard to understand. We ask 
why are good people allowed to suffer and die? In Jesus' case, it was his faith in his Father that carried him through his torment. From this we should learn that because of our faith, we will be carried through our losses. Jesus spent time during his last hours praying to the God that had put him there. They were not words of anger or resentment, or why me, Lord? They were words of dependent, uh, dependence on the Father, and words of forgiveness. Surely there is a lesson here for us when we feel that the weight of the world is on our shoulders. So what was the significance of the darkness? Darkness symbolizes God, God's anger and judgment. The whole land is dark, which means God's judgment is on the whole land. What do you make of Jesus' cry of abandonment? We see the punishment of God coming down. It's falling on one man, on Jesus on the cross. He finds himself abandoned by God. What does this mean for us? We have all sinned. We have rebelled against God. This rebellion, like any other crime, must be punished. The punishment for sin is death, separation from God. This is because God can't have anything imperfect near him. But because God is pure love, he doesn't want us to be separated from him forever. So he put his sinless son in our place, and the punishment that all of us deserve falls on Jesus. This leaves him separated from God. Jesus' death occurred at the time of Passover, which commemorated the time when the Lamb's blood had to be shed to save the Jews. Jesus is the new sacrificial lamb. Our imperfections are transferred into Jesus and we become perfect in God's sight. That's amazing, but it's true. Because of Jesus' death, anyone can be accepted, even the man responsible for Jesus' death. What's the significance of the torn curtain? Now everyone can come into God's presence. Station 13, Jesus is removed from the cross. It was customary to leave a corpse on the cross to rot and to be eaten by wild animals. But the Jews probably did not want such a sight displayed during the Passover season. According to the Gospels, one of the rulers of Israel named Joseph of Arimathea asked to remove Jesus from the cross and to bury the body. You remember, Joseph was a secret follower of Jesus. He exposed himself to danger in doing this thankless task, not only from the Roman soldiers, but also from the other members of the Sanhedrin who did not realize that he was a follower of Jesus, their enemies. It is significant that he had not come, had he not come forward, Jesus probably would not have received such a dignified burial. His disciples and family did not offer to do it. God raised this man up and gave him courage to come out of the closet so that the scripture could be fulfilled. What can we learn from this? Joseph aligned with secret Jesus in secret, but then he was led by God to publicly step up to the plate. He ignored the possible negative consequences to himself to accomplish a greater good. Would we do the same when we feel called by God, even though there may be dangerous or unpleasant circumstances? Station 14. Jesus is laid in the tomb. The tomb was probably carved out of a piece of rock. It may have had more than one compartment. It was customary to lay a body in there, and after several years when the flesh had decayed, the remaining bones were placed in an ossuary. This stone box remained in the tomb with other family members. Jesus' death was shameful, but he was buried respectively and honorably. Joseph of Arimathea, along with Nicodemus, who you remember was also a secret follower, wrapped his body in a shroud and placed it in a new tomb with herbs and spices in the traditional Jewish manner. In fact, the amount of these preparations was about 75 pounds, which was in line for a royal burial. Sometimes we treat a person one way in life and quite another after their death.
Well, this concludes our journey. I pray that you will ponder and reflect the enormity of what has been done for you out of God's immeasurable love. During your short stay on this earth, may you go and do likewise to others. Amen.